Hello and welcome to Editor's Pick, a War Elephant podcast, episode 17. I have with me my fellow co-hosts, Christine and Jaden. Hello, Ian. Hi, Jaden. And hello, everyone who's listening. Uh, as Christine just mentioned, my name is Ian. Uh, Christine and I and uh, Jaden all function as editors, and Christine and Jaden also function as sheepdogs and other executive functions in our War Elephant um, community. The War Elephant community is primarily hosted on the social media website Quora right now, but we also have a fantastic online community on Discord, the link to which you can join if you click on our show notes. Today, we have a couple of topics that we wanted to talk about, the three of us. The first of which is uh, the controversy over Senator Tom Cotton's military service, namely whether or not he should be able to be called an army ranger um, because he passed the ranger training but did not serve in the ranger battalion. Um, And a fellow member of Congress, I think a, a representative, not a senator, called him out because he did serve in the Ranger Battalion. However, uh, Newsweek made uh, a big deal in 2015 about two women who passed the Ranger camp, the same training that Tom Cotton went through, and called them Rangers. And when this controversy came to light a few weeks ago, they went back and edited that so it matched the Democratic congressperson's accusation of Tom Cotton, although Senator Cotton claims that he never claimed he was a ranger, but rather that he passed ranger training. Um, I, I really don't like this going back and editing things to match a Democratic poli- political operative's uh, narrative. Um, it's happened multiple times, but I think this one's especially egregious because they're basically taking away honor and attention they gave to these two fine uh, women soldiers who did the very difficult thing of passing this training and just to hurt Tom Cotton, who also passed the training, served uh, well in our military and now is uh, a senator and has served well, although controversially, and I have not always agreed with them. What do you think, Christine and Jaden? So, I am beyond creeped out by going back and editing anything. Uh, newspaper articles, uh, journals, magazines, the dictionary, etc. Just to win political points. To me, it is excessively Aurelian, Ian. It, it brought up to my mind immediately in 1984, and every record has been destroyed or falsified, every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, every date has been altered. History has stopped. Because if, as a society, we get used to things we remember no longer being there, no longer being true, we're really just being gaslit on a national level and for political reasons. It's pretty clear that this terminology ranger is used by the military in two ways. And one refers to the 75th Ranger Regiment and the other one refers to people who have passed the ranger training school. You have so many examples of uh, military commanders calling all ranger school graduates army rangers and i can hardly believe that this is anything but a way to not only create a political smear but gain power over the language agreed um the second thing i wanted to to talk about briefly this is just a brief thing before we get to our more meaty topics is um President Biden has issued so far, um, I believe, 40 executive orders over the last couple of weeks since he was inaugurated. And a lot of conservative commentators are saying that this is horrible, Um, just talking about the number of executive orders. And I am not a fan of executive orders in general, Um, but I think that 
if we're going to comment on them from a conservative perspective, we also need to comment that both President Trump and uh, George W. Bush, as well as Barack Obama and Vice President Biden, issued far too many executive orders. And I think Christine actually had some comments about a more nuanced take on executive orders generally from a conservative perspective. Yeah, thank you for asking about that, Ian. I know we were talking about this earlier, and I, I've told you I, I strongly dislike ruling by ruling by decree, is what I like to call the overuse of executive orders. But I think that it's quite important to note that what an executive order does falls into three different categories. There are executive orders that are simply uh, recognition of some event or some uh, group of people. These are extremely benign executive orders. Uh, they function very similarly to a number of bills that Congress passes where they recognize this day as such and such. Then there are executive orders that rework how the administration works. These can be very powerful, but again, are not necessarily a problem whatsoever because overseeing administration is exactly what the administrative branch is supposed to do. That is its proper function. And finally, you have executive orders that really amount to ruling by decree. Those are the ones that attempt to rewrite law, prevent enforcement of laws, and things like that, and bypass the will of Congress through executive action. And those are the ones I think that people have problems with. And when you start looking at just the raw number of executive orders without looking at those details, you don't really learn much useful about whether or not the executive orders are falling within the proper scope of the executive function or not, or whether they're beneficial or harmful. Absolutely. I mean, it really was Biden's intention from the start to undo everything Trump had done with executive orders as soon as possible. That was his platform that he ran on. It It isn't so much the fact that he had them all in the first week. It was what's in them, what's going to cause damage to our country. And I, I think like when it comes to like um, the pipeline. He shut it down, and now thousands of people are going to be or are out of work or will be out of work very soon. And that is very dangerous for our country. I mean, we already saw um, a 20 cent spike in gas prices, and it hasn't even stopped running yet. <laughs> it's, it's really concerning how things are going, but people are, are focusing too much on the numbers instead of what's in them, as you're saying. In the, that's probably the most concerning thing to me. So, um, now to one of our meteor topics. Um, on the subject of critical race theory, uh, we had a very important and careful um, piece exposing the California Board of Education's new curriculum that's very much based on critical race theory and the article actually analyzed it as thinly disguised neo-Marxism. It was a very devastating review. And the reason they could tell is because some of the people who reviewed it were refugees from the USSR and noticed that it was using the exact same um, wording and techniques to brainwash its subjects into accepting um, a propagandistic and violent ideology. Um, it also specifically removes Jewish people from the history of civil rights and um, calls people like uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a docile black person, um, sort of negating his idea of peaceful protest and persuasion instead of um, you know, the more violent work of the Black Panthers and Malcolm X. Um, I think this is really troubling that one of the biggest states in America is um, promoting something that is factually inaccurate through this omission and also 
really promotes a, a violent approach towards racial relationships. Um, and I wanted to hold up two people, um, Chloe Valdery and John McWhorter, both who have really excellent pieces or profiles in the Atlantic magazine, the Atlantic not being a particularly right-wing publication, highlighting um, really the excesses of this critical race theory approach to racial relationships, and especially in the case of Chloe Valdery, giving an alternative. She has a curriculum called The Theory of Enchantment in which she really focuses on building connections between people of all races and building maturity and resilience. And I think that really is what we as conservatives and liberals should focus on together in overcoming the current uh, racial hatreds that we see in our country from, from all sides of race. Ian, you know, this... It, it, it's notable that this was originally supported by a lot of people and who are coming back and saying that it's quite dangerous. And one of the reasons dangerous is not just California is adopting it. Uh, Seattle schools have already adopted this curriculum as well. And it calls for enmeshing in every single aspect of teaching the ideology behind it, that is the critical race theory. And I'm really worried about what this is going to lead to for the basically the public beliefs of, of children. Uh, it's not even a soft indoctrination, it's a hard indoctrination in an ideology that, as you said, spreads hate, and it relies on historical revisionism. In a lot of ways, this is quite related to our Ranger story, because they wrote out the history of the Jewish people in order to be able to portray them as people of privilege. And that is grossly disturbing. And of, of course, this is inevitable that a lot of the people who objected to it were, well, what about our ethnic group? Our ethnic group was was not included because when you make everything about government recognition of group identity, then groups are all going to just vie for being recognized and will be constantly bogged down in these essentially tribalistic jostling for funding and position and opportunity because the approach is now every group instead of every citizen or every individual uh Jaden, what do you think do you have you had a chance to take a look at any of these um developments in this particular area well, something I wanted to add on to with what uh, Christine just said about um, how groups are going to try to um, vie between the, each other for more power or influence or, um, or more resources directed towards just them is what, what came to my mind about that was more about like what happens on Twitter. A lot of people claim that they're more oppressed than others just because of their race or their uh, sexual orientation. And a term I've used in the past about, or to refer to this is like um, oppression Olympics, where they they claim they're more oppressed than others, so they get more clout or sympathy from other Twitter users. Um, and of course, nothing is going to be ever done about it because it's actually very profitable for them because Unfortunately, that's how everyone, a lot of people see it these days, and that's very concerning. Well, and that's because, it's a good point you bring up there, because what we're experiencing is a change in culture. So it was not that long ago that we had a culture of honor. and then where, where people's honor was the primary thing that that had uh, determined how they lived their life, how their morality worked, how they dealt ethically with all sorts of situations. And, and this, this overarching culture will 
dictate a great amount of behavior, both by the individual and by society, as it seeks to keep people in line with its mores. In the in the epic poem Beowulf, there's a wonderful line, and it says, "Among all people, everywhere, the path to power is behavior which is admired." So, under an honor culture. The path to power was to behave in an honorable fashion. But this, of course, led to things like um, dueling, uh, extrajudicial killing, um, honor killings. There, there are many, of course, the shame-driven oppression of women and of many minorities falls into honor culture quite well. Even slavery does. And we moved to a culture of dignity out of honor culture into dignity during the 19th century with most Western societies. And this has been written up by uh, several uh, economists and sociologists, uh, such as um, Campbell and Manning at UCLA, they're sociologists, who say that this culture of dignity had instead of viewing people as a piece of society and depending on their honor, it moves everyone to having an infinite amount of individual dignity. And that individual dignity is what dictated the way people treated each other, the rights they were believed to hold, and the responsibilities that they hold, how they handle conflict. And that's what we've, we grew up uh, experiencing, was a dignity culture. But what's going on with critical race theory and, and it's taking over is really a move, they argue, and I agree with them, to a culture of victimhood. And in the culture of victimhood, being a victim is the thing which is most admired and therefore is a path to power. And CRT explicitly uh, acknowledges and celebrates this. And training, training children in it trains them to see themselves as victims but it also trains themselves to see that the only way that they can have any power whatsoever in their own lives is to claim that victimhood and use the power the victimhood gives them to overcome other people. And this is a very dangerous new culture. Yes, and that tribalism is something that I wanted to highlight in our final story that we're going to look at tonight, which is... Um, it's actually a multi-layered story, and I'm using uh, a website in the show notes that I want to give a little caution about, um, although Jaden disagrees with me a bit. Uh, it's called Bounding Into Comics. It is a right-wing pop culture um, entertainment news site. Um, my frustration with it is it tends to be gossipy and inflammatory, very similar to the business practices of the overwhelming majority of liberal comics and pop culture websites. Um, so it's not necessarily doing something different than the standard practice of the day, but I was hoping, uh, I was actually following these people when they started this endeavor, I was hoping that they would have a bit more of a facts-based and less drama-focused um, approach, but they do not. They do, however, provide a good collection of uh, data and information about these topics. So I'm going to use them. Um, and specifically is talking about uh, two black uh, ladies who have been hired by Lucasfilm um, as part of their major entertainment uh, franchise edition starting this January called Star Wars The High Republic. And it is a... A part of Star Wars that I actually was very excited about personally because it takes place 200 years before any of these Star Wars films. So it's got the potential to be uh, brand new stories that aren't dependent on filling in gaps between the movies, um, which unfortunately is very much what a lot of the stuff Disney has been publishing. So even though they've been decent uh, books, sometimes they don't have any stakes because they're just about um, filling in gaps. They don't have their own story or characters or uh, setting up their own arcs. They're all about setting up the, the major properties. The, the books are considered basically paid advertisements by the consumer 
for the more expensive things like TV and and film. And I don't think that's very high quality. So I was excited about this this product because it had a brand new timeline and a brand new space to tell stories. Um, unfortunately, two of the people they've hired, one as a promoter, uh, she's going to host a podcast, and one as one of the writers for their middle grade, so children's fiction, uh, are black ladies who have expressed an extreme support of intersectionality, which is one of the um, tools of critical race theory. And it's the idea that white people um, should not take any kind of significant voice in conversations about race um, because they participate in the structural oppression of non-white people. And I think that this is actually uh, indicative of a very at the very least, bitterness, if not outright hatred uh, of white people. And I think that, well, certainly there are, are white people who have perpetrated racist uh, and bigoted things and profited from um, just being part of structures where they know people who have been in the industry a long time, which based on, you know, things like Jim Crow, did have more white people in them. Um, that can be frustrating. But it is... 2020, these people have been hired by the most powerful entertainment company in the world um, to promote explicitly uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, in the original project notes for this thing that came out, I've been following it for quite a while, about a year, um, they explicitly said they wanted diversity to be one of the things that attracted people to this series. Um, so they've been hired explicitly to do this, um, but they've done so in a very hostile way a very negative way and star wars came out in defense of this this hostility uh, from their official twitter organ and i think this is really frustrating when you compare it to something like um gina carano former uh mixed martial art fighter and actress who is on the television well streaming television show the mandalorian and she expressed that she is uh, not fully on board with progressive um, terminology about the transgender issue. She's also expressed willingness to talk uh, to people of a conservative um, persuasion. She actually did an interview with the Federalist magazine, uh, online magazine. And, um, you know, she got an enormous amount of, of harassment on social media. Um, and a lot of people calling to fire her. And to, to give context, the reason I bring this up is because there were some fans who were calling for these black ladies to be fired from Star Wars The High Republic. Um, and Star Wars came out officially and defended them, but they have said nothing whatsoever about uh, Gina Carano. Um, and I think that is really disturbing because it really shows that tribalism, that tribalistic mentality that has taken over our ability to talk to each other through things like stories and narratives and um, art, which I think is supposed to uh, tell us truths that can be uncomfortable, but not to pit, pit us against each other. And I feel like the way that Star Wars is approaching this project seems like it's intended to pit us against each other. And I think that's really destructive. Well, I certainly hope that their personal views about race um, will not destructively impact their work on what they're doing. I am almost positive they will because I read the first uh, novel in the series and it had the good guys constantly repeating the collectivist uh, phrase, we are all the Republic. It was really creepy, almost like they were some kind of brainwashed cult member. The, the, it makes me wonder, you know, if they understood what the entire ethos was going in. I'm not sure that George Lucas has the same viewpoint that he did when he wrote the initial pieces at all i mean I, th I think he's actually embraced collectivism to a great deal more than he did and i think we're actually seeing uh, historical revisionism about original intents i say this also about 
an entirely different fictional universe, Star Trek, that things are far more collectivist today in outlook than they were originally. Um, but when you embrace collectivism and then say, well, these are good collectivists and these are bad collectivists, well, all you're really boiling them down to is whether or not you like the person in charge. And that is a very dangerous road to go down because every person, every strong person in charge of collectivism winds up giving way to one who is less savory. I think this also has a lot to say about when it comes to figures like Joe Biden, when the Democrats argue that the president should have more power when a Democratic president is in office, they forget that if the Republicans win, and they will if they keep enacting unpopular policies, that they will use the same tools that the Democrat pol the Democrat politicians have been using that were generally unprecedented. So a lot of Democrats right now are arguing to end the filibuster in the Senate. And that would be destructive, absolutely destructive. It would decimate our country because they don't understand that it's the only thing that's really keeping absolutely wild policies from being enacted. But things that you agree with or disagree with. Because if, if and when the Republicans retake the Senate and the House, they won't have anything to stop the Republicans from passing every single policy that's on their list. And they just don't understand that. Well, I mean, it really depends on what you think their goal is. I think that the goal of someone coming from a intersectionality stace is to gain as much power so that um, only your view is heard. Um, and to some extent, I can't blame them because this is a human impulse. I don't think it's unique to critical race theory, but it is essential to critical race theory's methods, um, where it isn't with other uh, philosophies like conservatism or liberalism. You know, it's it's so interesting how everything has become politicized. Um, we've come a long way since the 1970 essay of Carol Hannis that used the personal is political as a slogan. And to me, it's quite amazing that in the last 50 years, this has almost become true of every single aspect of society, to the point Paul Krugman wrote, everything is political, not all that long ago. And we're certainly seeing that borne out in the decisions that editors are making for who they will hire as writers. We're seeing it made by companies in how it, it, they will do business with some people and not with others based on their politics. We're seeing it in all of the effects of cancel culture. And I think that these women are advocating a political mindset that they may be well-intentioned and believe that will lead to justice. They're, they're looking for what they call equity, but justice. But I believe that this mindset will simply lead to greater strife and oppression. And it's creep into every facet of our lives is just accelerating how people absorb it without even realizing that they're absorbing it. You, you are what you read. You are what you watch. You are what you listen to. And, of course, it's very easy for people to see when they listen to people who are angry and yelling all the time that they're absorbing this, this mindset that makes them angry about things. But it's a lot more subtle when it's... Oh. <laughs> we have lost Christine momentarily. <clears throat> But I would say that I co-sign what she's saying, that there's – and I want to I want to add a little bit of nuance. Uh, I majored in English twice, um, and I think that there's always been political elements, um, partly because humans are political creatures. So 
Um, I certainly would not go so far as to say that, say, Jane Austen was a secret radical on the side of French revolutionaries and against the reigning government of France. Um, I mean, reigning government of England, uh, particularly people like William Wilverhurst, were strong Christian uh, conservatives who were trying to ban the slave trade, but also had sort of a Patriot Act response to the French Revolution and sort of clamped down liberties. Um, but I do think that Austen had political commentary um, in her novels about, you know, the positions of women, education. Uh, she does even comment on the slave trade and uh, some of the hypocrisies of the landed gentry in England. Um, so I do think that politics has always been part of art uh, and popular art. Jane Austen was writing for money. She wasn't really writing, you know, just for a patron. Um, but that art was in the service of delighting and persuading um, rather than lecturing, uh, propagandizing, or, um, you know, making the politics the centerpiece of the art. And I think that that is a change, that, that there is no neutral space that we can come together and, and talk about political issues. Uh, and I've, I've tried in other podcasts and other uh, blog posts and tweets I've made to try and open some dialogue, but it's very difficult because people carry so much of their identity um, close to the surface. And this is... Uh, and and there's no resiliency. Everyone believes that a disagreement is an attack on identity. And I see this in myself, too. Um, I, I was recently commenting to my sister that I see a victim mentality in a lot of conservatives about um, the way that, you know, conservatives or Christian people are portrayed in uh, entertainment media. And I do think it is a problem. I think it is a problem that there are very few... Um, Christians, let alone conservative Christians. There's certainly some more liberal or centrist Christians, but very few conservative Christians who are uh, working in the entertainment media. And that means that that's an alien group of people to most people who are writing and directing and acting in uh, entertainment media. So they don't know. And if this were, you know, black people or, or another race or a transgender person or a gay person, they would have someone they could talk to. Um, and they would be expected to do research. They would be expected to go and talk to someone who was uh, a black person or a trans person and, and learn what their perspective, what their experience was like. But a Christian, uh, just because we quote unquote live in a Christian nation, despite the fact that we are no longer in any way a majority Christian nation, um, they're assumed that any commentary, especially negative, is just because, of course, I'm part of that culture, so it's okay if I comment negatively on that. Whereas I think that's dishonest and, and bad art. You should do your research and attempt to provide a complex uh, portrayal, even of things you disagree. Uh, and not... Sorry, I think I got sidetracked. Um, so Christians and conservatives are portrayed negatively because people don't do their research. And I think that is wrong. However, I think a lot of conservatives have responded to that in the exact same way that um, these two black ladies have responded to um, criticism of their work on the Star Wars project. Um, conservatives are like, we're victims. We, it's so unfair. And I think that while it's true that it's unfair, life's not fair. And conservatives especially... Um, should acknowledge that um, and and really respond with resilience and, and just push back and say, that's not right. Um, here's some examples of what it could be, but not be shrill or um, or really think of ourselves as victims. Because if you think of yourself as victims, you're, you're helpless. You're not able to affect change. You're not able to uh, find joy in life. Everything is about power and what is done to you. And I think that we really, as conservatives, need to get away from that mentality just as much as uh, liberals need to as well. You know, it's we're, it's what I said. that. We, oh, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> um, it's where it goes back to what I was saying about you become steeped in the culture, right? Um, and you are what you consume. And it's not only the fact that you are steeped in these ideas of critical race theory re regarding who's oppressed and who isn't oppressed, but you 
over time, we'll come to see as normal the whole worldview of everything being a zero-sum game and a power struggle. And I think that that's really been strongly affecting a lot of conservatives. We saw it in the entire Trump movement, to be honest, as well, was an acceptance of, of this worldview, like you said, that everyone's a victim. Transition to victim culture is more than just a left-right thing. It is a society-wide change. And even when you explicitly reject the conclusions someone makes because of their victim culture worldview, in the case of critical race theory, the, the um, ultimate uh, unassailability of the rightness of certain groups over other groups, if you reject that, but you don't recognize the underpinning philosophy of power and control that's driving this, you can very easily absorb that worldview. And I think that's happening a lot, as you said, with Christians and with with other groups, including a number of, of white people. And I think that's actually helping drive some of the animated racist, actual outright racist, um, commentary and, and things that we are actually starting to see as well. So that Does pretty that much, make sense? Yeah, I think that absolutely <laughs> makes sense. I think that's a, a good note to wrap things up on. Uh, Jaden, any final thoughts? No, you guys covered it just about as good as I could, so... All right. Almost as good as you could have. Thank you. Oh man, <laughs> well, we missed geez. out. We should have let uh, we should let Jaden do the the whole thing. Yeah, uh, right. we'll just let you do the next podcast. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> okay, so this has been uh, Editor's Pick of War Elephant Podcast, Episode Seventeen. Thank you so much for listening. Please give us a like or a view. Uh, share us on Twitter. Join our community both on quora and on discord the links will be in the show notes thank you for listening and we'll hear from you next time have a great day <laughs>